I'm Mary Ann Barbara. I'll be moderating this session for you. I won't be talking long, but I will provide you with some very good information. Um, we want to thank Happily, our platform host, for sponsoring this uh, series. Uh, and we also want to thank the Arizona Sunbelt chapter uh, for sponsoring the CE for this course. Uh, if you're attending the webinar live, your attendance will automatically be uploaded to the Events Industry Council with the email tied to your webinar registration. If your email does not match, you must contact EIC directly. The process can take uh, six to eight weeks after the live webinar for it to appear in your profile. If you attend this webinar on demand and it is being recorded, you must self-report your attendance uh, using your registration confirmation email you received in your inbox. Um, so with that, I do want to remind everyone that um, our, our two attorneys today, John Howe and Josh Grimes, are with us. Uh, they are doing this webinar without any compensation whatsoever, just because they're really nice guys. And, um, and they're here to help. They're here to help the industry in any way they can. Um, so I would ask you to respect that and to remember that they present this for your information that they are indeed attorneys uh, licensed to practice uh, but they are not your attorneys so uh, cannot respond to any specific questions on um, specific contracts that you have at the end of this presentation there will be contact information for both of them and if you need that kind of assistance you can contact them directly with that, um, I would remind you to please put any questions you have in the chat, in the chat uh, box, and uh, we already have a large number of questions, questions from people who, who uh, provided them when they registered. With that, I am going to introduce John Howe and Josh Grimes. And John, if you'll go first, followed by Josh. And well, I want thanks. To thank, th thank, thank you, Marianne. Talk. Thank you, Happily. Thank you, Arizona Chapter, for all of the things that you've done. I never thought that uh, I would be the opening act to a space shuttle transmission for the first time in nine years from the United States to the to this International Space Station. But I guess that's where we are, Josh, as, as to bringing this forward. Uh, I sometimes kind of think that we're a little bit in the same position these days of going into the unknown and traveling through new waters that we have never been through before or new destinations. But certainly uh, <clears throat> the comment has been made that this is the new norm. It's not the new norm, it's a new reality. And so I think that today we're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the past questions, some of the past issues that are there. But I think today it's really, what do we need to do to prepare as we go forward into this era of a new reality, into the new uncharted space that is so important for us to be able to comprehend, to plan for, and to evaluate. Nobody likes the unknown. That's the part of the fear that we all have. Tell me what it is and maybe I can cope with it, or at least I can cope with it a lot better if I have some semblance of an idea. So one of the suggestions we're making to clients and others is, it, it is a time of watchful waiting, if you will, but importantly would be getting a sense of what your attendee base, your exhibitor base, your sponsor base really wants to do. What are their feelings? Doing some surveys, whether it being picking up the phone, making some phone calls, uh, putting out a blanket, simple, easy survey to respond to, but find out what people are thinking. What are they going to be prepared to get back on an airplane and fly someone somewhere for a destination? What kind of programs are they prepared to participate in? What is going to be important to them as to what you're doing relative to their safety and health if they're going to attend your program. So I think that considering what is important, today it's attitude. What are people's attitudes towards how they're going to proceed in the future? Uh, what are they gonna do? When are they, as I said, when are they gonna be ready to travel? And then under what circumstances? Are they only gonna go to a place where they can drive? Are they only gonna go to a place that's within an easy access to them? Are they gonna to go to an area 
uh, to a hotel that uh, has certified certain steps that they're taking to protect the safety and the integrity of the people who are going there. And we also now have with some of these hotels having been closed down, Josh and I were talking about this yesterday, but we now have Legionnaire's disease cropping back up. So we have a whole lot of old factors that have been revitalized by the new factors as to how we're going forward. So I think we're in a, uh, a situation where we're reevaluating. We can't base our numbers on what we thought in 2019. 2019 was probably the best year many of us ever saw in our lives. 2020 is probably the worst year many of us are going to see in our whole lives. But what is 2021 going to look like? Much less what's the rest of 2020 going to look like and going out beyond that. Let's find out what the feeling is. Let's find out what people are prepared to do. Let's plan accordingly. We're not going to be booking as many sleeping rooms as we might have in the past, but we may want to have that opportunity rather than being able to decrease our low block, but rather to increase our block. So scheduling, understanding, anticipating, and preparing for what is going to happen in the future, which we really don't know, but at least make some anticipation of things getting better. After the 1918 Spanish flu, it was a period for a while because it came out of World War I at the same time where there was a resurrection. We got into the Roaring Twenties. Remember, it was the Roaring Twenties, the Thirties, and then we had the Depression. So it was up, 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 and then slam down. We're sort of in the slam down right now, so let's plan for how we're going to get the up, up, up. Okay, hey, well, let me just say, John just gave a really great summary of where we've been and why we're here today. So I'm not even going to try really to add on that, except just to say that um, everything's changing. Two weeks ago when we did part one of this presentation, um, we were still talking a lot about cancellations and how to deal with, with, with those. And there's still talk about that. But what I've seen in the last two weeks, and I think we've all seen this, now we're more focused on we've got health protocols that are out there. How are we going to move forward? And under what conditions can we move forward? Um, you know, so we're beginning to talk about, and, and mo many of our states have at least started, to, most have started to come out from the stay at home orders. So it, as John said, we're starting to look ahead and, um, Hopefully the, the questions we can answer in the next hour will, will reflect that. But I, I think that's a positive sign. We've got a long way to go, but uh, we're all in this together as we've heard many times. So thanks and thanks for everyone for uh, coming back and to, to Marianne and Rod and John and the Happily people for putting this together. Thanks. And I also want to thank, call out um, Rod Abraham who is on this call. Um, who has just stepped down as co-chair of the ISBO, um, the Independent and Small Business Owners Advisory Board. Um, he's done a wonderful job, and uh, I am filling very large shoes. Um, not, nothing to do with shoe size now, but very large shoes in, uh, in following Rod as a co-chair with John. With that, I think we should uh, get going. Um, any opening remarks on uh, how you want to proceed, guys? I think just take the questions. Whatever take you want to dive do. right in. Yeah. All righty. And, and remember, please put your questions uh, in the chat. And uh, I will put them down on our spreadsheet. And we'll take it from there. Um, let's see. We have two questions. Hi. Can you put yourself on mute, please, if you're not a speaker? Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Um, we have two questions dealing with escrows, uh, which I know absolutely nothing about, so I'll be all ears on these twos. Um, the question from Marie Peterson says, can you explain how the request to escrow deposits work in the real world? John, you want to start this one? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Uh, <clears throat> the purpose of an escrow <clears throat> is to uh, protect the integrity of the money, the financial backup rel relative to the program. What we're seeing in this era right now is that many 
organizations have worked with hotels to provide for a delay or a postponement of when the dates are going to be effective for the program. <clears throat> maybe it's one year out, maybe it's two years out. But the question is, will that hotel be around at the time performance is going to be required? And so how do you treat that deposit? Well, one way we treat that deposit is to place that money into the hands of a third party with an agreement that the third party will maintain those funds until such time as either the, the hotel has performed or in the event the hotel has not performed, then the money would go back to the organization that had placed it in deposit. The key element here is to provide an intermediary neutral source which holds the funds dependent upon an agreement between the escrow agent and the two parties as to how and when the monies would be dispersed. And in this situation today, and we use this, any of you who do international meetings, and most particularly in Europe, will either find that you're making deposits, placing them in escrow, or you're using a standby letter of credit, which is probably not appropriate this time around, but escrows are. I will, at full disclosure, I have a, a client called Meetings Escrow, which does this as a business. But there are other organizations out there which certainly provide similar services such as banks, international banks and the like, who can work with you. And it's all, there is a fee involved for handling the escrow. But look at it as that escrow is somewhat of an insurance policy for both parties. If the organization goes under, the hotel is protected. The hotel goes under or can't perform, the organization is protected. Mm -hmm. Right. Let me just add to that. Uh, escrows are a great idea in this circumstance, but what I'm finding is sort of the devil is in the details, as they say. Uh, you need a third-party escrow that's acceptable to, to both sides, and then you need an agreement as far as when the money is going to be transferred, uh, both in terms of time of transfer and also under what conditions. <coughs> and sometimes that adds, an, it's another layer of, of things that you have to negotiate. I'll also say that escrow is even good uh, with when you're you're dealing with a vendor uh, or any party who maybe you're unsure because maybe they're financially unstable in general. Maybe they've declared bankruptcy in the past. Uh, so escrow can be uh, good in that situation as well. So thanks. And before we move on, let me just say in case anyone's noticing, um, Timon in the background here usually doesn't get in the, to sit in on John Howe's webinar, so he wanted to uh, make sure he had an opportunity. Thank you. Okay, the other question That's dealing there. with uh, <laughs> dealing with escrows um, is uh, from Anna from the Weiss Institute. And she would like to know about escrow funds and what the pros and cons, and if you guys feel you've uh, answered that already, um, then uh, we can move on. I'll just say what the pro is, it protects the money. The con is it costs you money to protect the money. Because <laughs> the escrow age is not free. No. <clears throat> right. Okay, so with that, I think we'll just move on um let's talk about performance now question from sean lynch what about a performance provision within new agreements identifying the need to manage per local guidelines and of course uh sean is talking about the physical distancing and uh, all of the other protocols that are coming on board could i, could I start with this one sure Okay, so that's a very good point, and frankly, I would insist on it right now because, uh, as everyone knows, uh, we don't know where we're going to be in a few months, and we don't know what the protocols are going to be, but we do know that there are most likely going to be uh, protocols in terms of social distancing, uh, cleaning protocols, and things like that uh, going forward for months, if not for years at this point. So what I suggest that people put in their contracts is two things. One is um, saying that, assuming in this case you're dealing with a hotel, but it could be any kind of vendor, that the hotel agrees to follow uh, commercial standards or best practices for 
uh, cleaning and social distancing, and, and that would include rules and regulations applicable to the jurisdiction where the meeting's happening. Um, and also, if your group has any particular protocols, you want them to follow. The, the hotel would agree to, uh, to follow those. And then if they don't, and it's demonstrated that someone gets sick because of it, they should, there should be an indemnification and they accept liability without going into all the issues about proof right now, because I'm guessing that we might deal with it later. If someone is being paid to follow the protocols and they're telling you they're going to do it and then they make a mistake, they should have uh, responsibility just like in any other situation. John, go ahead. Well, hi, Sean. And Sean, I know, is here in the Chicago area. And one of the things that we have is sort of a dichotomy between the mayor of Chicago, the governor of Illinois, and the courts, which are now being uh, faced with challenges to the various protocols and opening stages that have been imposed by the governor as well as the, uh, as well as the mayor. So I think one of the key elements, too, is to also have a compliance with, with law provision in the contract beyond the voluntary protocols that may be in place. We're also seeing with WTCC, and we're also seeing with American Hotel and Lodging Association, various recommendations that are being made. We've also seen pronouncements by the major brand hotels as to what they're doing for purposes of providing for the safety and health of the people who come into the hotel, as well as for their own staff. I think it's important too to recognize that many times you may have an attendee who shows up and you may have a face mask requirement in place, and that person sort of reluctantly says, hell no, I'm not gonna put the face mask on. You should have some provisions in your own agreements as to what is proper behavior and conduct by the people who attend. You do have the right to have someone taken away from your meeting or taken out of your program if they don't follow your protocols, if they are endangering or you perceive that they're endangering others who might be in attendance. So it's an overall agreement by the supplier, by the hotel, by you, by your attendees as to compliance with the protocols. It's nice to have them, but let's face it, if we look at the beaches and the social distancing that was taking place over the last couple of weekends, we know that people may say, yeah, that's a nice protocol, but hell no, I won't go. So we need to be very cognizant of that and also recognizing what's good today probably won't be the same tomorrow because of the changes that have taken place. Each state has their own opening programs. The CDC has made recommendations, uh, but we have a whole plethora of different types of regulations, protocols, and issues out there. The key element is stay on top of it, checking always with the venue. Your, your Convention and Visitors Bureau should be a good source of maintaining information to you as to what's going on in their town. I just saw an item out of Las Vegas that if you go and check into a resort hotel, uh, your temperature is over, I think, 104, 101 or something. Uh, they'll have you sit down for 15 minutes. They'll take your temperature again uh, at the end of 15 minutes. If it's still up there, they will have you move over to a designated hotel, which will be a quarantine zone for people who have entered into Las Vegas who have symptoms uh, relating to COVID or any other types of disease that might be involved at that time. You will then be quarantined, et cetera. How that's all gonna work, I don't know. But it is an interesting approach that's being taken by Las Vegas as to the resort hotels and 10 designated hotels, which are nine casino hotels uh, that would be willing and have accepted the people coming to them. Right, if I could just add something, because John brought up several good points, but two of them I just want to emphasize here. Um, one is there are so many different levels of government involved with that all have their could have their own rules besides the AH and LA and the various hotel companies. So I just wrote a few of them down. There's World Health Organization, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control. There's other parts of the federal government that differ, frankly, without being political. The White House differs from the CDC. Uh, there's state governments, there's local governments, and then you've got the hotel companies and then the group hosting the, org the, the meeting ought to have their own thoughts about what needs to happen. So you need to be specific about which protocols are going to be followed and who's going to be in charge of them. And really, it's a great point about enforcement because you can have the best rules about mask wearing, about wearing gloves, about washing your hands. But if there's no enforcement, 
then they're really not going to be effective. And that's important for liability, but more importantly, it's important so your people don't get sick. So these are all things that you have to think about when you're going forward with your meetings. So thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna to turn to one um, out of order here, and it has to do with state by state guidelines, which we, um, Kristen Thompson asked, do you know of a specific website that you can find safety guidelines by state? And I wanna point the audience uh, to Michelle Eggert's post at 12.20 p.m. And right before that, to Steve Kinsley's report, also at 12.20, uh, they are both giving you links to um, websites that will have that information for you. That way we don't get more people asking the same question. Um, one, we... one comment I would make here too, Marianne, is that uh, just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. Right. Um, and, and I think the more you can go, if you're gonna check out what's going on, let's say in Chicago, go to the Chicago website by the government, by the mayor's office, check it out there. Uh, the old concept of, uh, right. there was there was a, the old story here, we had the Chicago News Bureau where if you were a young reporter and you would show up before the city editor who was a gruff old newspaper man, and anytime you came in, he'd really castigate the young reporter and he's, the young reporter looked at the city editor and said, well, my mother still loves me, to which the city editor said, check it out. <laughs> and and remember, remember, these things change so often, too. I mean, when I'm looking at some of the hotels right now with clients, you know, there can be, the, you know, there, the governors issue executive orders all the time, and then county executives can issue, can issue orders, mayors can issue orders, and they just change constantly, which is why your contract needs to provide for uh, a, a means of ascertaining what's applicable at the time of your meeting and you not get roped into when you, the, whatever's in effect at the time you sign the contract. Because frankly, it's probably gonna be outdated even if your meeting is two months from now. Okay, so moving on to our favorite topic, force majeure. Uh, Melanie, Bro of Amex GBT wants to know how would you manage a placement fee to explain this to a potential new client? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not sure I do either. Um, Melanie, if you're online, can you ask me and I'm gonna move on to another question and then we'll come back to you. Um, it may be some sort of a COVID-19 fee for like sanitizers and such. I'm guessing, I don't really know. Uh, this is- which, which, by the, which by the way, since you said it, though I know you wanted to move on, this is the latest thing we've seen for the last few weeks is now uh, surcharges for extra cleaning and extra procedures that the, the venues and the suppliers have to follow. I will put this in the category of not necessarily an illegitimate charge. I think we're going to see them more and more. I hope I'm not giving anyone any ideas on this particular webinar, but the key is they should be like a resort fee. They should be disclosed in advance and they should be agreed upon by all parties. Otherwise, just putting it on at the time of the meeting is nothing but a problem. Go ahead, I'm okay. sorry to interrupt. No, I think that probably will answer the question as oh. well. Those key words must be disclosed in advance, I think are, are absolutely ones that people need to hear. Um, audience- well, let, let, me just, let me add something to that. Uh, if it's a requirement that's being placed on the hotel for purposes of operating, is that a legitimate fee to pass on back to the client? Otherwise the hotel, if they don't meet those requirements, can they perform the obligations under the contract? I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but I do say it does raise an issue as to how you negotiate. And that should that not then be part and parcel of how the fees are structured by the hotel. In fairness to the hotel, however, they have no clue what they're gonna be obligated to do as it goes forward. They're just as much surprised as you are if they suddenly have a city says, you've got to sanitize, you've got to do a, a, a deep cleaning before you can open up. You've got to wipe down all the public spaces at least 25 times a day or whatever. So in fairness to the property, 
uh, they have that cost that's built into it as well. So it's going to be something where let's go back to the concept that we've been working through this whole thing during this whole pandemic is we're in a time when we have partnerships. We share in risk and we share in reward. And this is a time again where we're sharing in the risk. So how do the parties move to a point where they minimize the risk that is being encountered by both sides? Okay, I, I, I'm gonna be a little less polite and diplomatic than, than my colleague on this uh, because there's a reason we have 25 page meeting contracts. It's because people put everything in writing or you can't count on them basic tenant. And in this case, in a normal, I'm not saying that a, an extra COVID-19 fee is illegitimate. I'm saying that it has to be agreed upon. But having said that, in the current before COVID-19, hotels had to clean, right? Nobody said you're cleaning, except for meat exhibit space. No one usually said you have to clean X times a day. Here are the procedures your housekeeping needs to follow. So I don't believe it automatically follows that there should be extra charges for COVID-19 cleaning. I am sympathetic that hotels have to do more now to be safe, but it can't be a fee that's added on without the planner, or the, the meeting host's agreement, uh, because it's, if it's not in the contract originally, uh, because it wasn't part of the bargain, the extra fee. So uh, I, I agree with Josh. I, I think the key element here is that right now, if you have a contract that's in place and they come back and say, oh, we're going to charge you a cleaning fee, I tell them, go pound sand. Uh, it's not in the contract. Many contracts that we do say no fees shall exceed X. That's it. And that you cannot go above that for a sleeping room or a meeting room or anything else. You've agreed to that. You assume the risk of business. I assume the risk of business when I agree to it. If I don't show up, you're going to hit me for cancellation. If I do show up, I'm not going to pay your extra fee. That is a requirement placed upon you in order for you to be able to perform services right. that I contracted with you to perform. Right. So before we move on to our next question at uh, 1221 p.m., there is also a post from David Kleiman who reminds everyone that the SpaceX launch will occur at 4.33 p.m. Eastern time and he provides a link for everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you. Don't fly your airplane, David. Right. <laughs> Go watch them. I'm, I'm just no, relieved. it's after we're done. <laughs> just after you're done. I, I, I wish I could tell you that everyone in my family is watching this webinar, but the reality <laughs> is they were all watching for the SpaceX launch. So now at least I can join them later. Yes, we, we will, will be done be, in time, folks. Yes, we'll be done in time for the space mm -hmm. launch. Um, still on the topic of force majeure, um, and I would remind everyone if you've not seen the, the announcement that came out this morning, um, Marriott's furloughs are extending to October. So as we approach this next question, I think that has to uh, factor itself into what's going on in the industry and whether there, you know, there should be a cancellation or can performance occur or, or any of those questions. So we'll go to Tina Bowling's question. Uh, if a hotel contracts outlines, contract outlines spaces and set and can no longer be met due to the social distancing guidelines, is that sufficient cause for the association to cancel the contract without penalty? Note that no deposit has been paid to the hotel meetings late July, contracted attendance was 500, and the event was to be held in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. So without, this is, my answer is certainly not responsive to the location. This would be the same answer anywhere. Um, the, you know, the, the hotel's obligation under the contract is to provide, is to provide certain function space, presumably. And uh, some contracts say that that function space cannot be changed without the group's consent. Um, if there now are, are rules 
that laws, not recommendations, but laws preventing, first of all, let me say the other way. If it's recommendations, then again, I don't believe that changes much of anything if the group doesn't want to go along. If it's law that says that you have to space certain ways so the hotel can't accommodate, the first thing I would say is, you should try and work it out with the hotel. Hopefully they have the space to accommodate you in other function space or rearrange things because that would be a win-win for everyone. At the end of the day though, if the question was, is that a force majeure? I would say, this is one of those questions, maybe depending on who's paying you, a lawyer can answer differently. But John Smart, we know lawyers don't act that way, don't we? But I would say if I were representing a planner that wanted to get out of the contract, that this very well could be a force majeure because it's now become impossible or illegal for the property to perform according to the contract. So that's a sort of worst case scenario about it or if the group's looking to get out. But otherwise I would say it's a realization that that you know we have to change the way we're doing things because of the COVID-19 it'd be better to work it out. If, if you have a program scheduled for 500 people and you're going to an area that says no group over let's say 50 is going to be permitted uh, you got an even better cause here for pulling the plug on the whole thing than worrying about the social distancing within within the meeting room because your whole premise of your program is based upon and I bet what you have is certain occupancy requirements for the hotel or for the event space as to the number of people they have to accommodate. Number two, from a practical standpoint, let's go back to what I said at the beginning. How many of those people are gonna show up anyway uh, at the meeting based upon their own personal preferences? If it's an association, you're at the mercy of the fact that association members can go or not go as they see fit. You're in a corporate environment, you have a little bit different deal, but many corporations right now have no travel bans in effect relative to non-essential travel. And the organization is probably, if it hasn't already, been trying to figure out ways by which they can pull the plug on programs. What we have seen now has been a bit of creep, um, if you will. Um, we were successful in being able to delay, cancel, postpone meetings through the month of July. Now the creep is into August and we're having some success. Now the new September, October window is one that are being contemplated for people of making moves to cancel mm -hmm. out. So this again is a matter of creep. Your force majeure clauses, with a lot of them, you're best waiting till that last minute when you have to make a decision to make your decision as to going forward or not going forward. Or again, going back to the property, going back to your suppliers, and seeing what can work for both of you with the hope that something in the future might work. Then again, it might not. And then you have to roll the dice as to how you're gonna play the game. Yeah, if I could just add to that to that very good answer, the, maybe my response was skewed a little bit because I've been dealing with a number of contracts in the last week or two in, for meetings in what, what we used to call second tier cities. Uh, I don't know right now if that the tiers have been messed up a little bit, but where there's so much excess space that where the group and, and the hotel anticipate a problem with space, they've been able to find lots of function space in ne hotels next door or the convention center and work something out that, that works. But John's certainly correct that if you just can't have the meeting, the way you want or where you just can't accommodate anyone, that is a valid reason to cancel. Thanks. Okay, um, moving on another um, force majeure question from Jennifer. I won't name the hotel. Um, the resort is not being cooperative with one of our clients who wants to move their events to 2021 because Placer County, that's in California, uh, is open, so they say the event can be held. The attendees are healthcare related throughout the state and they can't see how they could hold their meeting as planned. The resort wants to charge them full cancellation fee and move a small part of that deposit for 2021. They are the first to tell us that since they are open, the meeting must go on. 
Well, here, let's take a look at, we got to look at the contract to make some decisions overall as to what it is. In the healthcare field, uh, we're finding with some healthcare, uh, they may be employees of the state or working for a governmental body, and the governmental body is not about to release them to go to the program. So you may have that requirement within the contract. So a lot depends on the contract. I, I don't think there's any blanket answer to that that can be given without having a little bit more detail and analysis of the exact situation of the property, that what the county has done and the like. Um, then you have the problem of people getting there, what happens and so on and so forth. And let, let me just uh, just add to that. And um, the, the, the other way is I would sort of, uh, and, and John's obviously right, that you have to look at the contract and the other factors, but I would turn the tables a little bit on this one and look at the resort's ability to perform. Uh, most, when I've encountered the situation to about now where they're saying we're open, so we're enforcing. I don't know that we're talking about an independent property, but it frequently is when they take this sort of hardline position and what, or it's a resort destination. And what I say is, well, they knew this was, this, this meeting contemplated use of a swimming pool, use of a, maybe a golf course, use of a fitness center, use of the spa, have, there's a bar, there's supposed to be a restaurant. Are all those amenities being able to be supplied by the, by the hotel, by the resort? And I don't know the answer based on the few facts we've gotten us, but if the, re, if the resort can't perform all of its material obligations, then, it, then there may be a, a real question as to whether either side can perform. And that may reframe the discussion. And, and, and Josh is right. We, we, we basically go back to the property and say, what, what assurance do I have yeah. that you can perform? By the way, I can't even reach my sales manager because you furloughed him. Um, <laughs> the talk is through. Can't get hold of the convention service person because they've been fired, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have all of these factors that come into play. And that, that becomes a discussion item. But let's go back, we go back to the basic, what the contract provides, what the requirements are on both parties, um, how realistic is it? And again, I'll go back to the basic question, especially in healthcare, how many of those people are gonna show up, period? Uh, because they've got other requirements that are placed upon them right now that they're not about to leave and go someplace for a meeting. It's just not gonna happen. Right, and, and one other, go ahead, may I? Or Yes, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. I just just one other thing that that um, sort of caught you know came to mind while we're having this conversation. Um, understand that that these discussions are you know they're they're discussions that you hope you're having in good faith, but the facts on the ground as to what the devastation that's happened to the meetings and the hospitality industry of the last two and a half months have changed this a little bit. And some, there are, there are some hotels and resorts and frankly, any kind of supplier who behind the scenes acknowledge that they can't perform, but that doesn't mean they're going to admit it because they are leaking cash like everybody is and they'd like to A, keep your business or B, if they can't keep as much of your deposits or cancellation damages as they can. So if you wait to get agreement in every circumstance, unfortunately, you might be waiting a long time. So no, one other thing, Josh, I just make a comment here, is <laughs> that you made the comment about independent hotels. Uh, hey guys, the brands are also the same situation. And in some cases, <laughs> even worse than the independents. Um, the only other thing that, that I would add to that is if those healthcare workers are government employees, um, their budgets are going to be slashed dramatically in the states because of a lack of funding, and um, and that and I know from working with government employees that uh, the first thing to go is membership dues, and the second thing to go is training. So um, those are are both issues that that can impact people as well. Uh, this question comes from Amy. Does the hotel have a responsibility? to let meeting planners know if their property or meeting space closed for a period of time. While these are unprecedented times, I called the hotels to check 
in only to find out their hotel or part of it is closed? Well, in a, of course, in a perfect world, you would hope that they're going to tell you. Um, but I don't necessarily, my experience is you can't rely on that. Um, and that's for two possible reasons. One is because they may not want you to know and if they can collect some sort of cancellation damages, they'd like to. But the other thing is, as John related a few minutes ago, the people you were dealing with may have been furloughed or laid off and there's nobody to tell you. Uh, so sort of the, the short answer is that you'd like them to tell you, but do they have to? You know, I, you know, I, I, there's no one's going to arrest them if they don't tell you. I, I think the best thing here is you know, your own due diligence. Right. Uh, you've got to check it out. One of the things I do is if I have large groups going into a particular locale, I make sure I get on the website for the local newspaper just to get a feel for what's going on. I made the comment about Las Vegas. Well, I, I watched the Las Vegas Journal Courier just to see what's going on in Vegas because we have so many of our clients that use Vegas. <clears throat> so it's important to stay on top of what's going on there. So you've got conflict. <clears throat> if you have Chicago, you want to look at what the Tribune or the Sun-Times is saying. If you're in Atlanta, you want to look at the Atlanta Constitution. I mean, there are things that you can protect yourself by just staying on top of it. And that, you know, a good meeting professional is doing that already. And, and this, yeah, this is not just in this context. I mean, for instance, <clears throat> I have a, uh, a client with a property where, where uh, they have the right, if the property changes flags, you know, changes brand, they have a right to, to get out of the contract. And in this situation uh, with this property, there is a rumor it's going to change. Um, so, but the hotel is not telling us. Uh, so we look at the industry newspapers online every day and see what's going on because it, it's sort of trust. We trust the, vet, the the hotel, but it's better to verify it for ourselves. Us, but there, one thing too, we just have it in the contract itself. There's an affirmative obligation on the property to notify you of change in flag, change in ownership, remodeling, reconstruction, not only the hotel, but in the surrounding area. Those things put an affirmative burden on the hotel to do that. If they don't notify you, then the hotel's in breach of contract. And, and John, let me ask you, how many times has they, have they actually told one of your clients when they first- uh, I, 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 With one exception this year, I've had three hotels give notice. Uh, the okay. one exception was where the planner found out that the hotel was going to be remodeling when she went down two days before the meeting was to start and uh, couldn't get in the main entrance because remodeling right. was going on. Well, if John has that kind of good track record, you know he's obviously much more intimidating in his contracts than <laughs> I am. I doubt it, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe that John, you know, his words about uh, being on top of things, trends for your clients, et cetera, um, in the meeting professional realm also includes uh, making sure you know what's going on at that property. Absolutely. I had a meeting in um, Schomburg, which if you don't know is right outside of, of Chicago. And I was actually in Chicago three months before my meeting and um, it ended early. And I said, oh, what am I gonna do? Go sit out at O'Hare? No, I think I'll go visit the property. So I hopped in a cab, went to the property, got to the property, which um, was a brand hotel, but independently owned, um, who had changed ownership from a, um, a part of the brand to a franchise, had never uh, advised of the change of ownership, and had a big old cyclone fence around the entire hotel because they were remodeling it, and never said a word. Due uh, diligence is the answer. Yeah, due diligence is the answer, and I, 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 I advise anybody if your your principals are telling you they don't want to spend the money for you to go, tell them that story, because mm -hmm. it it's it's one of those things. Had I not gone there, we wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have been able to take action and all of that. Um, before I ask this next question, I want to acknowledge Mary Lynn Christman. Uh, who is responsible for getting us hooked up with the Arizona Sunbelt chapter 
and um, aggressively worked uh, to get us the credits that you will receive for today and the one before if you attended that one. Uh, those have been sent off to, to them to send to EIC. And um, again, if you missed my um, presentation at the beginning about how to go get your credits, um, then send me a, a, a message and, and I, I will repeat it for you. But again, just give a big shout out in the chat to Mary Lynn. She surely deserves it. And here's her question. Uh, I have a client that was planning a wedding in June. The venue can no longer accommodate their si wedding size due to social distancing. They do not have a contract with a force majeure clause, but have something like a lease agreement. Are they basic basically SOL at this point? Well, let's see what the contract says. It goes back to that. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to say. Marianne, I know we have about three minutes before this ends officially, but I think Josh and I agreed that we would be happy to hang on and happily agreed to happily extend the period of time for another 10 minutes so we can get off in plenty of time for everybody to run out and take a look at the space launch uh, if it's going forward and uh, do it. One other thing that Josh and I talked about with you uh, was that to the extent we can, uh, what we might do is do a, uh, a quick video of 30 minutes with some of the remaining questions uh, and then place it online through the ISPOS community at MPI. Yes, and, uh, and I think that's going to happen because just like uh, the part one, we have more questions and more questions and more questions and not enough time to answer them all, but are we looking at a part three also? We may be looking at a part three and there's a question in there that may even um, produce a, another separate webinar on um, the, a trickle down effect, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, did we answer Mary Lynn's question? Oh, about the wedding. Yes. Um, so I would, John said that, you know, yeah, that depends on what's in the contract. I would also just point out that um, virtually everywhere has a, a force majeure uh, principle that is built into law either as part of what we call common law. And it's meaning that it's through years of developing case law uh, in courts. And also it's statutory. And so like in California, uh, there's a statutory force majeure provision. So that could help even if there is none. Uh, but strictly speaking, a force majeure is only when it becomes illegal or impossible to perform. And then there's things, doctrines, I won't bother everyone with, but call it like frustration of purpose, things like that that could be looked at. Um, but this sounds like a situation where if the meeting can't, if the meeting, if the wedding can't happen because of social distancing requirements, then it ought to be cancelable with uh, money returned because that's a, the government regulation made it impossible to have the meeting. The, the one thing I've found also though with, with weddings is that generally the bride and groom would like to go through with it uh, and therefore postpone the reception and postpone it to a later date or maybe hold a certainly a reduced number of people and then come back later for a better cer ceremony. Mm -hmm. But I, I, again, that becomes have a negotiation, please. Talk to the people, see what works. Because mm -hmm. your guests are not going to be, I'm sure they all want to come, but if they're going to come, they want to have certain safeguards in place already. Okay, if we have one more question on, under the force majeure, and I'm not sure you, you gentlemen can provide this, but I'll read the question. Uh, can you provide recommended force majeure contract verbiage? I think I addressed that at the beginning. Uh, that you're not their lawyers, um, that includes impossibility and impracticability, impracticability, I hate that word, um, as has been mentioned in previous webinars. I was previously using this follow following clause and she gives a clause, performance of this agreement by either party is subject to acts of God, war, strikes, civil unrest, government authority, or any other emergency that makes it impossible, illegal, or commercially impossible for name of company to provide its services for the client. 
Well, um, so they asked if we could provide a force majeure clause in 60 seconds or less. Let, let, let me just say, um, let me just say some things I've learned in the last two months with force majeure clauses. And I've learned a lot about them as much as I thought I knew a lot about them before this. Um, one is that if things, we hope things never go to court, but you have to write them like they might. And they have to be written very specifically to cover pretty much anything that's unforeseen that might happen. So for instance, if your force majeure clause doesn't mention disease, pandemic, some virus, some words like that, a court might likely to say it's not meant to cover that. Even if you say force majeure includes A, B, C, D, E, and any other comparable unforeseen occurrence, you need to have language that somehow mentions disease, illness, pandemic, what have you. So go back and look at your force majeure clause and imagine crap, and I wouldn't use the word crap, but we're in a polite audience, crap that could happen. What might happen? Because certainly we've seen crap happen this year and include that. The other thing is when you talk about government regulation, do you just mean government regulation? Because if you're gonna refer to the CDC, they don't issue regulations, they issue recommendations and advisories. So maybe you should include regulation, advisory, mandate, order, uh, any sorts of thing that, that various government agencies do. And then of course, at, and besides the various levels of government we talked about previously. So I'm gonna stop with that as sort of the extra things you need to think about now with force majeure. But again, just go back, look at your clauses and say, what am I missing? Here is, here is something I've been preaching for a long time. So many times I look at a meeting contract, a hotel contract, a convention center contract, and I see it and it tells who the parties are, it tells what the dates are, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't say, why are you holding the meeting? State the purpose of your meeting. What is it to accomplish? Who is it to bring together? Josh made the comment earlier, frustration of purpose. Well, if I don't know what the purpose is and it's not in the contract, how can there be frustration? And so what I suggest very strongly, right at the beginning of the contract, you set forth very succinctly why the heck you're going forward with the program. So many times we see, sometimes there are situations, obviously, that you don't know what the hell the purpose of the meeting is. But let's try to set forth up front, why are you getting together? Is it to provide education related to this and that? Is it to have and hear speaker X come and speak to the group, et cetera, et cetera. So if speaker X doesn't show up, your purpose has been frustrated. And so you have a whole different area where you can go forward and challenge what's going on. Please set forth why you're holding the program. What is the purpose? And before we go into the cancellation questions, we have um, a thank you from uh, Jennifer McDonald out of Sacramento, who I've known for years. Um, and it's just a lovely thing that I, you guys need to hear. And I want to, I want to say it publicly. I've not been active in MPI events, but love all MPI does for our community and never hesitate to pay my dues because of the value of folks like Marianne, Joshua, and Jonathan. Your sharing of expertise and is invaluable to me and my clients. Thank you. I, I just saw a quick note from Rich Maseko down in Tampa. And, and or St. Pete. Rich, the, the answer is, you know, you don't call the frustration of your state right up front. The purpose of this program is colon. Then you put back in the force majeure or what gives you the right to cancel or modify the contract without liability in state, any kind of frustration of purpose is set forth above. Okay, so here's a, um, we're closing in on one o'clock, but hopefully uh, we can get to uh, this question and maybe two of them. Um, if you cancel an event and there is no dispute over the deposit being returned, how long legally does a hotel have to return that deposit to you? Is there any recourse to get your money back in say 30 days versus whenever the hotel wants to return it? 
um, it's been 90 days already. Well, it, it, the, the answer is, is that the hotel will never return it as fast as you would like. And particularly in these circumstances, um, I see properties say they need 60 days, they need 90 days, uh, sometimes they even need more. Um, without going into any s sort of cynicism, uh, I would look at it that if they've agreed to give you your money back, whether they have to or whether they voluntarily do, uh, would, and you believe they're going to actually do it, you just be patient because there isn't a lot you can do about it anyway. Um, if you went to court, of course, you got costs, you got distractions, and that's really the only way you can get the money back uh, if they don't willingly give it to you, and that's going to take a long time, too. One thing for sure, confirm in writing that yes. that the deposit will be refunded yes. and say we anticipate receiving this within X number of days. So yes. you sort of push the burden back as what your expectation is. Not that that gives you any more reason to believe you'll get it, but it does give you a little bit more force of argument that uh, there was an agreement, they were going to repay it, and so please repay it. This is a reasonable period of time for you to do so, etc. Right. So there's a late question that several people want answered, and I will, I will read that one to you. Uh, hang on. Um, Never mind. I'll go back to this question and then I'll find it. <laughs> hey, they're, they're talking too fast for me. Uh, the chat is very active in case you didn't know it. Um, is a company change in financial situation caused by COVID-19 cause for cancellation under force majeure? No. Or... <laughs> but, 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 but. <laughs> Well, the reason, the reason I say that, the reason I say that is that I will have built in, it's not a force majeure in itself. It can be a basis upon which you can cancel without liability if you set forward in the contract right. that financial instability of either party is grounds for cause to cancel the agreement without liability. But to say it's a force majeure uh, is not going to really cut the mustard on this one. Right, and let me just say on, on that, if you, want, if, if you want to cancel yourself because your company is having financial distress, you should define that in the contract as far as what that means. So sometimes I see some financial companies say, uh, if the stock market goes down 25% in a month, then we can cancel, which doesn't deal with your particular company. Uh, but y y John's right, bottom line, no, it's not a force majeure. And so the next question you might want to read, Marianne, and then we'll just hold the answer till part three. <laughs> Actually, the next question was a repeat of the question I just um, asked you. So we got that one in, but we have a whole bunch else that we uh, don't have in yet. And uh, I'm going to uh, find a, an appropriate time very quickly uh, for the both of you to... Um, to answer uh, that, uh, the questions for me, and, uh, and then we can uh, record it. In addition okay. to recording the uh, questions, um, we will be re uh, preparing a recording for, um, for this session. Uh, the one from part one is already online. Uh, I will send uh, the people who attended the this session over to um, Arizona to um, get those to um, or in for the EIC credit. And then I will let everyone know when the recording of this is available and when the recording of the uh, remainder of the questions is also available. And I uh, hope that takes care of everybody's questions. I, I thank everybody on the call and in particular uh, John and, uh, and Josh who have been great to work with and I think have provided an excellent value for, for the members of the community and for MPI as a whole and, and on behalf of them I thank all of you. Thank you.
Thank well, you, Marianne. Thank you, Happily. Thank yes. you, Atlanta Chapter. And yes. all, uh, also uh, for uh, our Arizona. Arizona Chapter, I'm sorry, Arizona <laughs> Chapter. And for all of those of you who are not part of the community, the Independent Small Business Owners Community, sign up now. Absolutely. Right. Take care, and the space shuttle is going to go. Yes, well. it is. All righty. Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.